let's get into it. Hopefully we can get some people in. So welcome to the ultimate buyer's guide of buying flip houses. So this video is for anybody who's looking to buy a house and who may run into flip properties, properties that were recently renovated and you know what a property flip is some investor or somebody buys a house they fix it up and then they try to sell it to you i think there are a lot of specific things involved in purchasing a house like this that you know if you have insider information or kind of understand what flippers go through and some of the common things to look out for you're going to be a more informed buyer this is on Facebook Live. It'll also be posted on YouTube after the fact. And um, also you can jump in the conversation, ask your question. You can put it in the comments. I do see the comments on my screen right here. Also, if you want to have a longer conversation or dialogue about something, the Zoom link is in the description as well. So you can hop on Zoom and we can talk more in depth about it. I think I'm specially qualified to talk about this topic because I'm a real estate agent, I'm an associate broker. I've helped buyers buy a lot of flip properties and I have sold a lot of our own flips as an investor, um, not just on um, doing the flip, but also being the agent and the listing agent for getting the house sold. So I have a, you know, I played every role in a transaction on a real estate flip. So I think that makes me qualified enough to speak about it. Um, and I definitely want to give my information and, and, you know, give you everything to look out for. The first thing, you know, I want to say though, is that I think there's a lot of content out there that scares people and will tell people to run away if they see X, Y, Z. I don't think anything's that black or white. And I know that's boring for internet content. I know people on YouTube and if you read on Google and, and whatever advice, they'll say, if, if you see this, just back out of the deal, don't do it or don't buy the house. I don't believe that for any issue. Even I remember, you know, one thing that always sticks with me is never buy a house with a bad roof or a bad, bad foundation. And I think this type of advice that's absolutist is dumb. And this is why real estate agents are still actually important because they can put things in perspective for you. And the other skilled trades, home inspections and things like that are very important because you know, for example, I bought a duplex um, last summer without ever seeing the property and it had a foundation problem. And I still bought the property because it was only $6,000 to get it repaired. So I just factored that in. So never let someone, a content creator, something you read, scare you away. And that is not the intent of what I'm doing here. But what I want to do is arm you with tools that you can use when you're going through property so that you're aware um, because what can happen and this, I, I think most flippers actually are trying to do a good job, but there are flippers, especially in this real estate market that put lipstick on a pig basically. And, you know, they'll make everything look nice as far as the finishes, which we'll get into um, the difference between the finishes and the bones of the property, but they, they do a lot to make it look nice. And especially first time buyers really don't know the difference because they'll look around and say, oh, wow, this property is really nice. Um, but they won't see the things that actually cost a lot of money because a big secret is that finishes um, are not really the most expensive thing. And they are probably not the thing that you should look at. They're the thing that you see on HDTV and every, you know, everybody cares about, but that's really not the important thing to look at when you're looking at a house. So we're going to talk about all these things. Hopefully by the end of this, if you watch the whole thing, probably most people will watch it on YouTube after the fact, um, you will be more informed and you'll at, see the thing about this is when you have a real estate agent and you're buying a property, you have all these experts around you, but you know, you still need to know what questions to ask and be able to kind of understand and read into things because you could buy a house with no information, no knowledge. And as long as you have good people around you, you'll probably be okay. But if 
you don't have good um, agents, loan officers, inspectors, stuff like that. You do need to be your own advocate. And this will give you a baseline of information to kind of look at stuff. So let's get into it. Hey, Paris, what's going on? Uh, make sure you guys are asking your questions as I'm going through. Um, you know, it's definitely helpful for me because I might gloss over something, um, especially being in this for so long. And, you know, it's always hard to know how detailed to get into something. And I get worried about generalities because, like I was saying, if, you know, general information is not super useful, but it does give you a baseline of information. So first thing I want to talk about is... What's go, what is a flipper and like what are their motivations? What's their psychology? What are they, what are they trying to do and accomplish, right? So a real estate flipper slash investor, it's not really investing, but they're trying to buy a property for less than what it's worth or even if they bought it for what it's worth, they could still make money if they do the rehab cheap enough to sell it for more. Uh, once it's fixed up, fixed up. So they're going to buy the house, fix it up and sell it. That's basically what they're going to do. Everyone kind of knows that. Um, the thing about flippers is that most professional flippers, and, and this is a distinction that you're going to have to make when you're looking at properties. And these are questions that you could ask your agent um, is to see if the flipper has done multiple properties before. So you can kind of see if they're, accomplished or if it's somebody's first time because those two things are very different um, flippers that are experienced are probably going to have some metrics that they're going to want to accomplish like when they bought the property they had an arv or an after repair value um, thought of when they decided to buy the property right so they already knew what they were going to buy the property for what the repairs were what it was going to sell for and how much money they were going to make and usually just work backwards from those numbers. Uh, so uh, my estimation of what investors kind of want to get um, from talking to other investors and, and myself is like a 30% uh, profit margin is kind of what they're looking for. So whatever they put into it, they're going to want to make 30%. Now, it's probably getting less and less as the market's getting more competitive, but that is around what they're going to want to make. Um, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of different types of investors, and it's very evident when you when you look at a property to be able to tell what kind of investor they are and what we'll kind of talk about these different types and, and, and see, you know, you could get a, I can, I can walk at a property and know right away what kind of investor they are, if they're professional, if they're first time, if they're the cut corners guy, if they're the overdo it investor, there's all kinds of things that you can look for. Um, my first tip is to, if you're going to look at a flip property and, and it's pretty easy to identify them, if most of the things are updated in the property, uh, more than likely it's a flip property. Um, and so once that bell goes off, you can actually look at pictures of the property before, especially like on Zillow or realtor.com. Now you can kind of go back and look at the old photos. A lot of times they'll be right there. And um, this is helpful because you can kind of like instantly you'll know if, if they change things like the roof or the windows or the siding because if the house looks different, you know, I've, I've actually done um, a transaction where they added a second level to the house. So the old pictures was like a rancher. And then now all of a sudden it had two stories. So it's very helpful to know that uh, because now you're now you know that everything on the second floor is brand new. But it also raises questions um, because that's that's. It's not advanced, but it's, it's something not typical for a flipper to do. And you want to make sure that the workmanship of adding a whole second floor to the property is good. And as we go through this, you'll, you'll kind of think you'll kind of get some tips on, you know, clue, really, these things are clues that 
the person knows what they're doing or if they're being cheap or if they have integrity or not. Cause I think it comes down to that. When you're buying a flip property, the biggest thing I try to figure out is does the flipper seem to have integrity? Do they care about the product that they're delivering to the end customer or are they just trying to make a quick buck and they don't care about their name reputation what happens to you six months from now that's really to me the core of it like what is the vibe that i'm getting from what i'm looking at when i'm at the property so we're going to look at the before pictures we're also going to look at and and you don't have to do this you can ask your agent hey um you, first of all, you can ask your agent if you can't find pictures before of before pictures of the property when the flipper bought it. Because if they bought it within six months to a year, you, they'll be in the MLS most likely. Um, if it's a private transaction, maybe not. But a lot of times you could find some photos, even if you use Google Earth. The second thing that you want to do is see, ask your agent, uh, or you can look it up in public records, what the flipper paid for the property because again, like I said, they are going to want to make about 30% profit and they're going to want to maximize it. But the minimum really used to be 30%. Nowadays it might be a little bit less, but um, if you could tell what they paid for the property and then you see the before pictures, you can probably tell the type of repairs that they did and you can kind of estimate what they put into the the property. So you'll know like their break even point. So if they bought the house for a hundred thousand and it looks like they put in maybe 50,000, 60,000, you know that they have to sell, they have the net at least that to break even. So that's 150,000. Now what realtor costs and all the stuff, really they're going to have to sell a house and it depends what the financing they have, but they'd have to sell a house for a hundred sixty seven a hundred seventy five something like that to break even so if you understand their mentality it helps you negotiate a little bit i know the market stuff right now there's not a lot of negotiating but i'm hoping that this video and this information can outlast this current market when things go back to normal let me check my comments nope no comments all right let's keep going um we're gonna look at the before pictures one thing to know, though, when you look at what they paid for the property, say they got the property for 10000 and they're making a whole bunch of money. This is going to be contradictory, but what they paid for the house is kind of irrelevant to you, right? Like they're still no matter what they bought the property for or what their profit margin is, they're going to want to sell it for the most money possible. But if you know they're making a lot of money on the property and there's no other offers, it is more likely that they're going to accept your offer um, if they're still making a lot, but maybe they're not capitalizing on the total value. You know, maybe it's 5, 10K less than what it could sell for. Maybe you have a good type of mortgage or something like that where, you know, you're a little bit in a better negotiating position. So that's definitely something like you got to balance the two things because I, I've had clients where like they're making a hundred thousand dollars and they, they, it becomes like an ego thing. They just don't want to let the investor make that profit. Even though the next person's just going to buy the house. That's why that shouldn't matter exactly. But knowing how much they're going to make does help you negotiate, but that doesn't mean, you know, try to get them, super low. It, just, it gives you a clue into the mentality, the mindset, what the flipper is thinking as far as selling the property. And I do think that is valuable. Now, like I said, when you first go to the property, we've already looked at the before pictures. So we kind of have an idea of what it used to look like. When I go in a property, the first thing I really notice is obviously the curb appeal one thing I like to point out is if, because here's something flippers do. They, once they finish a property and put it in the market, sometimes they don't cut the grass. And this doesn't make them a bad investor, flipper or whatever, but it does say something about what they care about, right? Like if the grass starts getting overgrown, they either are running out of money, didn't have a landscaping budget, and or they just don't care, right? So they, they just, it, it, 
it's a clue into the mentality of the flipper, which I think is the most important part because you're never going to know what's behind the walls. You can do in home inspections and you can get clues to it, but you don't know um, what corners they cut. And that's why it's really important to it, that. That's why I'm making those video because, you know, if there's a lot of red flags, maybe it does make sense to walk away and we're going to, and, and I'm going to give you as much ammunition as possible to be able to figure that out. And let me check my comments again. Nope. Okay. So you're going to notice the curb appeal. Did they put new siding on the pro So I'm in the Northeast. If you guys are in different locations, there's, diff there's different building methods, but normally there's, you know, vinyl or aluminum siding, or they could have stucco or brick or different things on the outside of the house. What, what is the outside of the house? Is it new? So if it's new, they probably did that. And, you know, I always think it's a green flag instead of a red flag if they did the siding and stuff because the return on the investment isn't that high for that kind of thing, but that shows a pride of ownership and that they want to give you a good product. Or it could have meant that it was so bad that they had to change it. But um, if the outside of the house if the siding or whatever is new, that's a really good, that's like, they get a lot of points for doing that. Right. Um, and, and, and obviously if that's done, you know, on a normal 1500, 2000 square foot house, if they did all the siding, that's probably mm, eight to $12,000 about. So they spent a, you know, that's something that you don't have to factor in, uh, for 15 to 30 years, as a homeowner. So that's good. Um, another thing that I notice is windows. Windows are really big and it's something that first time home buyers don't care about. But if I see that a lot of the windows have been replaced, that's another green flag because again, the return on investment of windows for an investor is not that high because people will still buy a house with jacked up windows as long as like not jacked up, but old windows. <laughs> You know, um, they're less energy efficient. You're going to have to change them sooner. There's going to be issues. And a rule of thumb, if it's vinyl windows on like a regular type of construction, it's about $250 per window. Um, and that that's like bare minimum for, for, you know, if you're in fancy higher end stuff that throw that number away. But that's like a, a normal number to, to think about. Um, so we got the curb appeal. The roof is another one. Like if they redid the roof, there's probably a little bit more ROI on that. Um, and so they get less points, but as a buyer, you should value the roof quite significantly because it's tens of thousands of dollars, uh, most likely depending on the size of the house. So that's the benefit of buying a flip house. If you buy a flip house and it has all of the major um, components to the house fixed up. That's really good because now you are not going to have to change windows. You're not going to have to change a roof. You're not going to have to do siding or anything like that. And those things matter a lot more than, you know, even the kitchen and the bathroom and the nice finishes and the flooring, that stuff pales in comparison for price, uh, to the siding, the roof, um, and all those type of things. So, so always remember that. And this is how buyers get tricked, right? So as a first time home buyer or an inexperienced buyer, people look at, you know, all the HGTV stuff and see if they like it or not. Um, you know, they like, Oh, this, you know, the pain and, and the kitchen cabinets are nice. They got soft clothes and all this stuff. Meanwhile, the roof is old. The windows are old. The HVAC system is old. That's where all the real money is. So, you got to be careful about that. And that's basically the core of why I'm doing this video. Um, another thing about, so when you look at, for example, the siding, right? Did they put the siding over top old siding? And in my area, um, especially like Willingboro um, and some other towns, there are, there's asbestos siding and there's nothing wrong with sealing over the asbestos siding. 
but it is something that you want to know that they put siding over top of siding or asbestos siding because if you ever go to reside the house again for the third time you're going to have to rip that stuff off and it's an environmental you have to get special um license you have to get special people to come out to demo that stuff you have to seal it blah 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 it's much more expensive so that's something that you want to know um so you want to look at it, like if it's vinyl siding you want to look on the underside try to pull it back a little bit see if anything is underneath um to see if it's siding over siding and stuff like that because if they put I'll give them a pass on siding on the roof. You don't really want more than two layers of roof on a roof. Um, and what we mean by layers on the roof is if you have shingles, um, underneath the shingles is plywood. Nor this is normal building, you know, basic stuff in my area. It could be different in yours, but most areas is like that. So you have plywood under the roof shingles you know the stuff that you see underneath that is plywood um when the shingles get old you can put new shingles on and and not replace the plywood or you don't even have to take off the old shingles if they just put shingles on top of shingles you just want to check that it's not multiple layers. You can get away with two, but once you have two layers, the next time that you have to do the roof, it's going to cost more because you have to rip it off. So it's not a red flag if there's two layers, but if there's three, four, five crazy layers of uh, roofing on there, then you want to uh, factor that into your purchase decision and, and save money because you know that you're going to have to rip that off. Now, if there's new shingles on there, it's going to last 12, 15, 20 years, but you still got to um, factor that in. And that's the whole point of this is there's no one end all be all to any of this stuff. What's up, Kevin? There's no end all be all to any of this stuff. You just want to factor things in. Hey, I can deal with this. I'm going to have to budget to replace this or it's going to cost more 10 years from now to replace that. That's how you should approach buying a house. Um, any house, not, not just a flip house. Um, once we get inside the property, uh, sheetrock is the first thing that is easily noticeable. Um, sheetrock is the walls. You can see it right here. Boom. The walls that's sheetrock. Um, if it's, a bad job you can kind of you got to look like on the side of the wall you want to like look down this angle and you could tell if it's new because it'll be straight super straight there'll be no imperfections things like that if they you know because you could put sheetrock on top of the sheetrock and just paint it um, that's a little bit less good way to do it. Um, but there are sometimes reasons to do that, but essentially how does it look like? What's the level of workmanship in the sheetrock? Does it, is it straight? Are there spackle lines? Are there issues? You know, it's not a big deal. This is superficial stuff, but what it is telling you is the mentality of the investor. Um, a good, um, contractor is not going to find imperfections in the walls um, acceptable right or an investor is going to say no that's not acceptable you know because they're taking pride in the product that they're creating so check out the sheetrock like don't just look at the wall colors like look down the side of the wall you know say you know just try to just look at the details did they pay attention to the details or can you find imperfections that doesn't mean don't buy the house it just means they they didn't do their best at doing the sheetrock or the sheetrockers that they hired were not the best. The other one, this is a big one, trim is like an art form. And when you see bad trim, it's a red flag that some shoddy work might be have done elsewhere, right? Because... It's not that hard to do, but it is a skill and... It's really, you know, it just shows how much somebody cares. Like even here, um, this trim, I had I had my house, I've redid a lot of the things in my house. This was not redone yet. 
And this bothers me because of, of how the trim looks right now. Um, you can see gaps. You can see um, a little waviness and stuff like that. Again, this is my house. It's not it, the, overall the house has done well, but the trim, eh. So another clue, uh, if you have weird trim that's not finished or they didn't caulk it, you still see nail holes, things like that. That means that they weren't that good at finishing. Um, decks, um, I'm a little out of order, but that's all right. Uh, if it has a deck, make sure that there's not a deck built over the deck. So if you go underneath, sometimes what they'll do instead of taking the deck down is like rebuild the structure around the old structure that was not in good repair. Definitely don't want to see that. If you do see that red flag, because it's just, you know, it, it's just dumb, you know, like go that, do it the right. If people do things not the right way or like the easy way, they probably did it the easy way everywhere else. And so there's another clue for you that it could be a problem. Carla, what's up, Carla? Yo, we got five people in here. Okay, I appreciate y'all. Hopefully you guys learned something. Ask your questions, or if you want to hop on to the discussion, you could do that as well. We are talking about buying a house that was recently renovated by a flipper, but really this information could be helpful for anybody buying a house because these things, things are, these are things to look out for. Um, okay. These two are real big ones. Um, and let me first. So when you are looking at a house, everybody wants to look at kitchens and bathrooms and, and the flooring and all that kind of stuff. And that's what new people want to look at. The most important thing, if the property has a basement, all the money is on the outside of the house, the roof, the windows, um, the siding. And then inside, it's the HVAC system, electrical and plumbing, and the foundation. But all that stuff, you see it in the basement usually. So if the basement's not finished, or even if there's not a finished section, I always take clients down there. And as soon as I get in the basement, I go to work. I look at the plumbing. If the house was flipped, did they... Excuse me. Did they change the plumbing system or the, the, the water lines or the drains? So if the house was older, it originally it probably had copper um, and maybe a cast iron drain or uh, what's the other material? I can't even think of the other material, but you can tell when stuff is old and when stuff is new, right? So if you see new plumbing lines running from the water meter, to everywhere they redid all the plumbing that is fantastic if the house was built say in 1950 or something like that and you start seeing copper lines that look like they was around in 1950 that means you know your lines are what 70 years old that doesn't mean run away from the house that just means that your plumbing is old and copper lasts a long time but eventually it is going to leak so all your stuff upstairs might be look nice, beautiful, all that. You just need to know that, hey, they did not replace, replace the water lines. It's still copper. Because new construction, you're going to see um, they're usually blue for cold lines and red for hot water lines. That's PEX. That's a really awesome material to work with. Um, it's not freeze proof, but freeze resistant. It's, it's just easier to build with. It's kind of flexible. It's a really great material. So you'll see like blue lines, um, running through the house. And that's really, I like to see that. Um, it could also be different colors, but those, you know, they usually do blue for cold, red for hot. Uh, the other thing is if you see white PVC for the drain lines, um, that's a really good sign because drains are probably worse if they leak because they're bigger and it's poopy water. So you, you want to make sure, um, or you want to, you want to know if it's been updated or not is basically what you want to know. And if the thing about plumbing and electrical is that the outlet or the, 
um, or the fixture could have been replaced and maybe they, so if you look at a sink, if you look under the sink, they could have replaced part of it. But then when you go in the basement, it's the old stuff. So it's like patchwork. So you, so partially update it, but if, if the whole line isn't updated, it, it doesn't matter, right? Because you still have part of it that's from 1950 or whenever the house was there or an older thing. So just keep that in mind. You know, if you see, uh, so go in the basement, check out your plumbing system, your drains. The next thing is the electrical. So did they, did they run new electrical or not? Usually, um, if it's standard copper wire, Romex, um, that's been around for a long time. So it might be older, but it's still, um, modern electrical system. Um, if the house is a certain age, then you might have ungrounded um, things where you don't have the three prongs, but they'll probably have changed. So the outlet will have three plugs, but it doesn't actually have a ground because that third plug is actually for the ground wire. So that's a, a very common thing. It's not a super big deal, but again, it means that your electrical was not updated. Um, let me check for comments again. Let me see. Oh, Otis, who's my business partner, he's saying, don't forget black pipes to PVC. So when you're looking at drains, um, the drain pipes, white is the PVC and black is OBS. You don't want black ABS. You don't want the black going into the white pipes. So that's another thing to look at. And honestly, I'm not sure why, because the material is different or whatever, but it can it be prone to leaks. Um, so we're... Obviously, you want to look at the electrical panel, um, and then that's a good place to look up to see where the wires are coming in to be able to see if there's older wires going in there. Because sometimes it'll be a mixed patchwork. They'll have old stuff and new stuff, and you can clearly tell if it's brand new um, versus it being old. It being old for electrical isn't bad, but if it's a different type of wire... Um, if it's knob and tube, um, which you could, cl you'll clearly identify, you can ask your agent, Hey, is this knob and tube right here? Um, you'll, you'll really be able to tell. And if you Google knob and tube, it's very distinctive looking and your insurance is higher if you have knob and tube electrical. So that's mm -hmm. something to look at the basement waterproofing. Did they do anything to waterproof the basement? Are there signs of water? Um, in the basement. So this is a big one, right? Because when you buy a flip house, they usually don't disclose any issues with the property. They could have only had the house for one to three months. And if it didn't rain heavy or anything like that, they might legitimately not know if there are um, water problems in the basement or against the foundation or anything like that. Um, I, so I'm not saying that they always don't know. I'm just saying that it's possible that they have no clue about it. And so you want, you need to kind of um, be a detective about this. And again, the home inspector is going to do that. But again, you want to be your own best advocate. So you want to look, did they, you know, um, you know, usually you'll see like a white sealer on, on cinder blocks or, or things like, like you'll tell if something was done down there. Uh, you know, you don't need to be an expert to understand all the different types of ways to waterproof a property, but you will see, was it painted? Um, does it look like there was water somewhere? Or is there water stains? Is there mold? Is there like, what is going on down there? And actually it's a really good time to look at a house after it's rained uh, because you can go in the basement and, and be able to tell these things. So that's a really big one um, because again, they might not know there was an issue and uh, you could end up buying a house that has a water issue in the basement. Again, if it does have an issue, that allows you to negotiate, have them repair it, or you just at least know in your mind, I'm going to have to deal with this at some point. Um, or, you know, it just gives you tools in your tool belt. Um, and information is the most important thing. So even if you buy like a crappy house, as long as you know you're buying it with all these problems, I think that's a good thing, you know, as, as long as you're okay with that, you're getting it at the right appropriate price for the issues. There's no problem with that. Now you want to, I always tell people they need to save money for things. So if 
if you're buying a house with a, a roof that's 25 years old, you need to have a way to pay for a new roof, you know, at any moment because the roof could go bad and start leaking. So that's why knowledge is power with this stuff. And, and that's why I don't like to say just run away if X, Y, Z is because it could be a good deal, that house with a crappy roof, because that could be the only problem. So as long as you have the eight, twelve thousand dollars or a way to be able to get it um, to repair it and you're not and, and you're getting the price up at if you're getting the house at the right price, there's no problem with doing that. Um, here's an here's a really fun one. Oh, thanks, Carla. She says, uh, this is good info. I appreciate it. How many people we got in here? Okay, we got three people. Okay. And again, this will be on YouTube so people can check it out. And uh, again, you can ask your questions uh, in the comments or hop on, the, on uh, the Zoom link. I got that up too. Anyway, this one's my, f this is in rental properties a lot, but some flippers do this. Is everything painted over? How many layers of paint is on that trim? You know, like, what's the door look like? Is, is paint caked on everywhere? Can, is it hard to open windows and doors because there's paint everywhere? Are the outlets painted over? If stuff is painted all over, I almost want to say run away because they did a crappy job all throughout because that is unexcusable. That's ridiculous. Professional painters are not that expensive. Um, I hire them all the time. They do a great job and they will not paint over stuff and just not care about anything. So if stuff, if, if stuff is painted over, that's a big red flag. Uh, I would be very skeptical about the workmanship everywhere else. Um, all right. So we kind of talked about the big ticket items, but again, I just really, 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 really want to emphasize a really bad flip house could have a beautiful kitchen, flooring, um, curb appeal landscape. Usually they're not going to do landscaping if, if they did a bad job. So that's another tip, actually. If it has good landscaping, they probably care. But, um, you know, you just... <sighs> the look of the house in pictures can look great. And all the things that people care about when they buy a house could look great. And everything else could be jacked up and it cost you a lot of money. So make sure, you know, I know everybody wants to have all the fly shit in their house and, and have the modern gray monochromatic vibe going on and all that stuff. But if your roof, windows, electrical, plumbing, HVAC system is all old, jacked up. Just, you could buy the house, but just know you need the budget for all those things. Okay. Oh, so that's one thing I didn't talk about is the HVAC system. And again, this is a, is a interesting one because there's not the return on investment on buying a new AC unit is probably break even. So I'd say 50, 50% 50 of the time, You'll see most flippers replace it. Um, so I can't say it's a red flag if they don't. If it's, say, like a five, six, seven, eight year old unit, even a 12 year old unit, if it looks like it's in good shape. Um, and we're talking about heating and air conditioning, basically. Um, if it's a new system, obviously factor that into the value of the property because a new, um, a heating an AC unit might be six to eight thousand dollars. Now prices are going crazy, so uh, don't quote me on on the prices today. But um, again, you want to know. Okay, if they have a new HVAC system, that's six to ten, twelve thousand dollars. I don't need to spend for another fifteen years or so, twenty years, however long that lasts. So you want to bank that in your mind when you're thinking about the price of the property. Um, so yeah, look at that. Another, another interesting thing, and you'll never know is the insulation of the property. You, you, you're pretty much never going to know how it's insulated, um, behind the walls. And this has to do with your energy efficiency, what your heating and cooling bill is going to be, and just the general comfort of the property. My thing about that is 
again, this is why we're looking for clues because if they did a crappy job everywhere, then they probably didn't put good insulation in. They might not have insulated at all. If they did stuff that's at a good level, then that's probably what you would expect. And if they went above and beyond, maybe there's um, high level, high R rated insulation in there. Um, I have seen um, with a buyer, and that's why I recommended that the buyer buy the house uh, partially. Everything with the property was done very nicely. You know, they did the siding nicely, the windows were updated, the roof was done, new HVAC system. But the thing that I really noticed about it is that they insulated the ceiling of the basement. And I've never seen a flipper do that. And it seems to me that says, hey, it's not really that much more expensive to do this. And they had pride in ownership and said, I want to give somebody a good product that I feel good selling. Because there's a bunch of toxic stuff. I see all these TikToks and stuff saying, don't don't treat the house like your own. Just slap it together and sell it and make money and do the next one. And I don't agree with that. And that's not how me or my business partner have ever approached a flip. And we still made money. I think having integrity is important. I think for me at least, you know, or actually uh, me and my business partner, our reputation is important. We want to work. We work in our community that we live in very often. So we don't want to just sell somebody some crap. Like I, I live down the street from houses that I flipped and I know some of the people that bought the house and you know, I don't want to feel like I screwed somebody over, you know? And, and so that's, you know, integrity again is very important. And the only way that you're really going to know about a flipper's integrity is by the product that they are give are selling. And so when I when I noticed in the, in that example that they even added insulation in the basement that they definitely didn't have to. There's no return on investment on it. Um, that shows that they cared about the product that they were selling. So that's the basic sense of of what I'm really talking about with pretty much everything. So another distinction for buying a recently renovated or flip property is the repair negotiations. Because when you're buying a house from a normal homeowner, they usually don't have uh, contractors on, on speed dial. They don't have these type of resources. They don't get preferential um, treatment. You know, if, if a flipper is doing a lot of business, when they call the plumber, the plumber answers the phone. If you call the plumber, they may or may not answer the phone when they're busy. So then again, that goes back to figuring out what type of flipper it is. Are they experienced? Do they do a lot of business or not? Because it affects this portion of it. Because when you're negotiating for repairs, you've already got the house under contract. And now the home inspectors found issues for example, if there's an issue with the electrical, an outlet is not wired correctly, it's reverse polarity. So the positive and the negative are switched. The outlet still works, it's really not a big deal, but it's not correct. The flipper could call the electrician and say, hey, you wired this wrong, go fix it. Here's um, the outlet that you gotta fix. Um, it's for the home inspection. That electrician is not gonna charge them because that was the work that they did. So when you go into your um, think about what you want to ask for, um, it's not a big deal to ask for things that don't cost the flipper money. So that should be part of your strategy when you're working with your agent to figure out what you're going to ask to be repaired. Um, and that works for all the skilled trades. So if the, the issue, but here's the issue. If if the contractor did their own electrical and didn't have an electrician, well, first of all, they probably didn't get permits, but I don't even want to talk about permits because I have like a, I have a rogue opinion about permits. I, I don't think they're the most important thing in the world. I do. Obviously, if there's no permits, that means the, the contractor did the work themselves without permits. They're technically not supposed to do that, but there's plenty of contractors who could do good electrical work without 
doing that. Obviously, if they have an electrician, it's better, um, especially for this reason. So if you get resistance on those issues, it's probably because the, the contractor did their own electrical, especially if you don't see um, electrical sticker. I mean, if you don't see permit stickers on the electrical box on on uh, in the basement usually or somewhere for plumbing, electrical, HVAC, building, fire. Um, if you don't see inspection, uh, sorry if you do not see permit stickers they probably didn't get permits you could call and ask if they have permits again i'm not super big on the permits but it does tell you who did the work and it was inspected by the um the township or whoever in your town in your city or whatever who looks at the permits uh, i don't think that that really guarantees that the stuff is right and that's why i don't harp on it too much but you that is something to look for is do they have permit stickers if they don't have permit stickers that means that they probably didn't have a licensed electrician do the work um back to the negotiation though is um if they had an electrician do it it's going to be no issue for them to send that the electric the electrician back out to do it same thing with if there's a new hvac system and there's something wrong with the property or with with how it was done it's really nothing to have them come back because they want to guarantee their work they've probably worked together before um flippers have leverage with their their labor right because even for me for example if it, our electrician we've used multiple times so he wants to maintain that relationship and we want to have a good relationship with him too um so he's going to come back and fix stuff that clearly sh should have been fixed and if the home inspector says hey this is jacked up then he'll probably come back and fix it also don't assume that the flipper knows that all these problems existed because, you know, they they hire people like if they're a bigger flipper, they're probably hiring out all this work. So they might not even know. So it, they're not going to be offended that there's there's issues like this. They're just going to bring back the people now where there is an issue and this is why we wanted to look at the before pictures and see if it was redone is because if it's something that was already there when they bought the property they're probably not going to want to fix it because they didn't touch it and so they feel less responsible for it and stuff like that that doesn't mean don't ask for it that just means that there's that item that you're asking for is going to use up some of your negotiation equity if for you know so if it doesn't cost them anything, you're not using a lot of your negotiation equity um, to get something fixed. And basically what I'm saying negotiation equity is like if you ask for too much, they're more likely to be resistant to you. But if you ask for the right amount of stuff, especially stuff that doesn't cost them anything, they're even in this market where it's a seller's market, it's hard to get these repairs negotiated. Um, they're more likely to accept them. Let me check for comments real quick. No, no comments. Struggle streaming. It's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so that those are some of the important things as far as negotiations is did they touch? Did when I say touch, did they do some like did they renovate that part or was it there when they purchased the property? And beyond that did they hire someone to do it who's going to back up the work or not so if if again if they hired somebody to do that work like their electrician they're just going to come back it's no it's not going to be an issue at all and they probably appreciate that the home inspector found it and then they tell the electrician yo man why why'd you do five outlets backwards you know and they'll say oh i had their apprentice and he messed up or whatever and it's no big deal um those are my tips for buying a flip property. Um, I'm trying to think about any other things that you might run into or stories that I look. So overall, man, I, I, I think it's 50 50, right? You run into some really scumbag flippers and you could tell right away the workmanship is garbage. 
um, the, you know, you could just t you get the vibe of the house, man. If, if and don't get the vibe from the materials that they put in, because I've seen garbage flippers use ex material more expensive than I would put, and I'm always accused of overbuilding. Um, they'll put in marble and the granite countertops and and expensive kit kitchen hardware and all the stuff and they'll have like crazy uh they'll they'll put a nest thermostat and all that stuff to try to trick you and then all of a sudden you know you 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 look below the sink and it looks like freddy krueger was down there is 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 copper piping from 1935 that that clearly is about to go the drain here's an okay so here's another thing main drain lines the big drain that's going out to the street for anybody buying a house always see if that's updated because if it's not updated that is very expensive to repair again this is why information is important if that drain line is old you can get sewer line coverage to cover that so that might not be something that you want to die on the hill about to get repaired because you could get ten twenty thousand dollars of coverage for that and if it breaks just use the insurance now i'm not saying you know not to negotiate or do anything like that but that's a way to cover that back to my point if you're buying a house uh, a flip house ignore the finishes and finishes are the, the light fixtures, the flooring, the kitchen, um, cabinets, the tub, tile, stuff like that. Ign like, um, put that out of your mind. Did they do a good job? Is the grout in the tiles done nice? Is when I go to grab the shower fixture, does it shake? Is it firm? The details. Are the details done well? If the details are handled, that means that they had a pride of ownership. They had paid attention to the details. If every time you, you, if the doors don't close and there's all kinds of weird issues, they start being red flags. One issue, not a big deal, unless it's egregious. But when you start, when everything's jacked up, be concerned. And, and I'm not saying don't buy the house. I'm just saying, make sure you have money on the side to fix this stuff. Make sure you know what you're getting into. Don't pay top dollar as if everything is new when the roof is 20 years old still and the HVA system is old and they only replace some of the plumbing uh, at the fixture but not in the basement, stuff like that. Be careful. And um, that's all I got. I wish we could get some questions. Hopefully, um, we're going to get, you know, we're going to grow this. Uh, it's only on Facebook Live right now if you want to hop on the live to have a QA. and a If you're on YouTube and you want to watch these uh, live or add me as a friend on Facebook, I have space. But if you add me, just make sure that you send me a message because if we have no mutual friends, that's weird. So send me a message. Say, hey, I saw your YouTube. I wanted to check it out, blah, 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 whatever. Um, my Facebook people, eventually this is going to go YouTube live. Also bring me back the Ryan Got the Bread podcast. Um, I'm going to do it much more frequently. I'm building the studio right now. You're, here's This is my office control center part of the studio. And then over there, which I'll show you guys later, um, is going to be the set. Um, it's going to be live and interactive. That's what I'm going for uh, for next year. Um, I'm going to have guests. I'm going to do it more frequently. Some might just be with me, but I, I just, you know, I want to be more active. Also, not everything's going to be about real estate. Again, if you watch some of my other videos, oh man, I, you know, I do other things and real estate right now is tough and I don't have a lot to say. I want to do some more videos as far as um, informational videos um, like, you know, my FHA 203K video. It's just like, it's not a good time right now. And my, 
everything I try to do is about people coming up, you know, coming up in the world, getting better financially. And I feel like it's, it's a tough time right now for people like that. So I don't want to give advice and you can't execute on it. You know, I was talking about how easy it was to buy a house, um, back in the day, you know, a couple of years ago, 2019, 18, now it's not so easy. So, you know, it's just, I don't want to talk about it like it's easy and then you can't do it. So that's, that's where I'm at with that. And, um, that's about it guys. Be on the lookout for the next one. I try to try to go live. I tell myself every day it ain't going to be every day, but it's going to be every couple of days when I feel inspired with a good topic. Like I'm really excited about this topic. So thanks guys. See ya.